Hey everybody, it's You Had to Ask, the show where I answer your questions. And this week, my first question comes from Troubleshooter125, who says, Since the draft was ended, there has been talk here and there about mandating some kind of service of all U.S. citizens, either civilian or military. Obviously, not a whole lot has come of that. A chunk of me thinks it might be a good idea to help give people some sense of their duty as citizens. But the mandatory bit reminds me too much of the draft and the very bad taste it left in my mouth. And once again, I ask you for your thoughts on the matter. I'm conflicted about it, as I think you are from the sound of the question. On the one hand, some kind of mandatory service would, I think, help to instill in people a sense of community, a sense of responsibility, a sense of citizenship, uh, a concern for the country as a whole that I think in some cases is lacking. Uh, it might cause people to become more engaged in the political process. It might cause people to be more engaged in volunteerism and community organizing and those sorts of things like throughout their lives, not just when they're doing the, the mandatory service. So I think it, it could be a really, really good thing. But yeah, that mandatory thing really bothers me. It, it, I, I'm, I don't, I'm not comfortable with uh, selective service. I mean, we haven't had a draft a military draft in this country since Vietnam, but the fact that every uh, every man at age 18 has to register for the draft, has to register for selective service, uh, bothers me. I'm just I just don't like that. I don't I'm not comfortable with that. I'm not comfortable with compulsory military service, even if it hasn't been done for a generation. Um, if there were some way that we could encourage people to uh, to take part in that kind of service. If there were some sort of benefit that we could give to people um, that, would, that would sort of push young people, compel young people, not, not in a mandatory way, but sort of uh, apply a little bit of social pressure to, to cause young people to, to do that kind of service. Right before I started high school uh, was when, in my state, they introduced the community service requirement uh, to graduate, where in order to graduate from high school, in addition to having the grades and, and passing your classes and being promoted, you also had to complete at least 75 hours of community service during your years in high school uh, before you could graduate. And I remember at the time, I thought that was so unfair, and I just hated that. I thought that was just the worst idea uh, ever, and it was so wrong to force, like, what does this have to do with school? What does this have to do with education to force us to do this? But I did it, and I'm glad I did it. I mean, now I look back and I don't think it was that bad of an idea. And I think now this, the, the, the community service requirement, requiring students to perform community service before they graduate, I think is actually a wonderful idea. Um, so who knows? Maybe some kind of civil service or community service requirement uh, would, would be that kind of a thing. Mark Arangis, do you think voting for someone because they are something of a certain race, of a certain sex, of a certain religion, or lack thereof, is essentially the same as not voting for them because of that reason? An obvious example going around these days would be voting or not voting for Clinton because she is a woman. I don't think it's uh, advisable to vote for someone uh, just because of one of those factors. I don't think, because a lot of people, you know, when, when Obama was elected, there were, you know, resentful conservatives who were like, they just voted for him because he was black. Well, maybe some people did, but, you know, the fact that he was black sure as hell didn't help Alan Keyes, did it, when he ran for president. I mean, I, I don't think people voted for Barack Obama just because he was black. If you saw the fact that he was black and the fact that he would be the first black president as something good and something positive, then that was part of the reason you voted for him. But you also voted for him because you thought he was a good candidate, because you uh, supported his policies, or because you thought he would be a good leader or whatever. And I think the same thing should be true of Hillary or of anyone else who belongs to a category or uh, asserts an identity that has not been typically represented in politics. You know, I don't think you should vote for Hillary just because she is a woman and you want there to be a woman president for the first time. I think uh, maybe these sorts of categories should be looked at as tiebreakers. 
You know, let's say you have uh, you, you have two candidates who you agree with pretty much equally. You think they would both do an excellent job. Uh, you don't really favor one over the other, but one is a woman and the other is a man. And you think to yourself, well, they're equal on pretty much everything. I support them just about the same. I agree with them just about the same. I have equal amounts of confidence in their ability to be a good president. But one is a woman, and women have never occupied the White House. Women are a group that has never been represented in the presidency. So I'm going to vote for the woman. Something like that, I think, is, is a good thing and is, is a good way to sort of use those categories to make decisions. Because let's face it, if all you want is a woman to be president and that's the only thing you care about, uh, you know, you, you could find yourself voting for someone like Carly Fiorina or Michelle Bachman the time before or Sarah Palin. Uh, you need to be a little more discriminating than that. And I think most people are. I don't think there are really very many people. I don't think there's anybody who is intending to vote for Hillary just because she's a woman. I find it difficult to imagine someone not supporting Hillary in any of her policies, but saying, I'm going to vote for her because she's a woman and it's time we had a woman present. I just don't think that would happen. And I don't think that's a good idea. Vim Sweden. Hi, Steve. How were you taught about Native Americans in history class as a kid slash youth? I was recently thinking about how, as a kid growing up in Belgium, I was presented with an image of King Leopold II's reign that was very different from what he was actually up to in the Congo and the horrible stuff he did to the Congolese. And what do you think about calls to remove statues of such kings, military commanders, etc., from public spaces? Would you have them removed, or would you have another solution for these monuments? It's interesting, when I think about it, everything I was taught about Native Americans when I was in school was always in relation to white people. We didn't really have lessons about uh, the Native American culture, Native American history, pre-European colonization. It was all in the context of, and then the Europeans met the Indians, and here's what happened. Um, so there was very little, there was very little actual history being taught about the history of these cultures and these people. Um, so I, I mean, I, I can't, and of course, as you mentioned, you, you sort of allude to when you talk about how you're, what you were taught about King Leopold turned out to be different than the, the the truth or, or just a tiny part of the whole story. That's the same thing that I was taught about uh, the interactions between white people and Native Americans. That the, the role that white people played in uh, seriously, seriously damaging and, dis and in many cases just destroying, wiping out uh, indigenous people in, in the Americas was very, very downplayed. You know, I mean, we, we learned about the, the, the things that the Spanish did to the indigenous people of Central and South America uh, and Mexico. We learned about the Trail of Tears and sort of the worst, most infamous incidents uh, in the history of relations between Europeans and uh, Native Americans. But we didn't learn a lot about that. We didn't dwell on that too much. Um, and as for removing statues, I think that's perfectly appropriate. Just because uh, people living half a century ago or a century ago or however long ago decided that they wanted to memorialize and celebrate a leader with a statue or a monument, that doesn't mean that every subsequent generation has to accept that. Someone can put up a statue and someone 100 years later or 10 years later, whenever they change their minds, can take down a statue. Uh, there's nothing wrong with that. People are allowed to change their minds. People are allowed to have their views, their perceptions of a given figure and his or her place in history evolve and change. And uh, if you decide that some person that they erected a statue to at one point is no longer worth celebrating and is not something you want to have a monument of, to glorify, it's perfectly fine for people to get together and say, I think we should take this down. I don't think we should be commemorating this person. I don't think we should be memorializing this person. Um, it's not the same as erasing them from history. You don't want to hide the bad stuff. You don't want to, uh, you know, remove that person from history lessons. Uh, but if you decide, you know what, this isn't appropriate anymore. We don't want to celebrate this person with a statue or a monument. I think that's perfectly fine. I think that's a good thing.
Matt Helmers, Steve, when do you think it's appropriate to tell a child that God, heaven, magic isn't real? I live in the Deep South, and there can be social consequences for being an out-of-the-closet atheist. Also, there can be emotional consequences in telling a child that Pop-Pop is, in fact, not in heaven. I don't want my daughter to feel indoctrinated by me only to have her rebel against me by becoming a Christian. I also don't want to fill her head with bullshit. It's impossible for me to keep Christian dogma out of her head where I live, and their message can be very appealing and make sense to a child. I've gone so far as telling her that impossible things don't happen. I also told her that Satan and hell aren't real because it was making her anxious. I'm hesitant to drop a pipe bomb like, there is no benevolent God watching over us. Nobody's listening to your prayers. When you die, you're gone forever, etc. She is seven. What would you do? Well, I can try to speculate what I would do, but the truth is I don't have kids, and uh, it might be better for you to seek out advice, as perhaps you have, I don't mean to be presumptuous, as uh, perhaps you have sought out advice from other parents who have been in similar situations, who have had to deal with, you know, the struggle of, oh, what do I tell my kids? When do I tell them? Because um, I know, I, I found out about death at a very young age, you know? I was like, I was, I think, four, Five, something like that. I mean, when when I when it came home to me, probably even younger than that. I think it was probably about four. Uh, when it came home to me that people die, that you live and then you die and that's it. And I was taught to believe in heaven and to believe in God and to believe in all that stuff. But it was still really, really traumatic for me because I never really believed it. <laughs> like I always really wanted it to be true, but I never actually believed it sincerely, a hundred percent. So it was, it was tough for me when I found out about it when I was a kid, and I was much younger than your child was, is, uh, at the time. Um, I don't know, it's, I, my, my philosophy is, if you are asked a direct question, you shouldn't lie. I mean, maybe you can soft pedal it, maybe if, if your daughter says, a, asks you point blank, you know, uh, do we go to heaven when we die? You can maybe try to find a way to soften it. Uh... But I don't think you should ever say yes if you don't believe that that's what happens. Like, I don't think you should mislead a child. And I, just like if she asks you, Daddy, is there such a thing as Santa Claus? I don't think you should say yes. I mean, if they ask you the question and they want to know the truth, I think you should tell them the truth. I, I think you, you don't have to be blunt about it. You don't have to traumatize them. And I know you, you seem really concerned about that. You don't want to just, uh, you know rip away her veil of, of uh, you know, illusion all at once, because that can be tough for a kid. Um, but maybe find a way to gently let her in on it, you know, or, or, or give her a way of sort of finding it out herself. And then just be there to support her if she has trouble with that, you know, if it does make her anxious the way you say she was getting anxious about the idea of Satan and hell. Um, and just be there to support her. I don't know what else to tell you. I, I would highly recommend if you haven't, on the off chance you haven't, uh, if there's anybody that you, anybody else you know online who are non-believers and who have more experience as parents who have went through this sort of thing, I would, I would love for you to ask them because I'm sure they have much better advice <laughs> to give you about this than I do. Aaron Dill. Hi, Steve. I got to thinking after episode 54 of the Off Monday Ramble and wondered why you still live in Hagerstown. You seem pretty negative about the place, though I realize that may be played up for comedic shenanigans. Is it the lack of funds that's keeping you there? Family? Friends? Or do you secretly like the place more than you let on? It's a combination of all of that. I do play it up for comedic effect, uh, especially when I do, like I did on uh, the Off Monday Ramble this week, which was a reprise of the Riffing on Mail Call series. Yeah, I, I do play up you know, what a shithole Hagerstown is and how much I hate it. And you know, I, that is that is very exaggerated. But there is also truth in that. I mean, I do feel that way, just not nearly to that extent. And it's also that, yes, I, I mean, my family is all from around here. Uh, my friends, my in-real-life friends, almost all live in this area. Um, and I do feel connected to this place. This is where I'm from. This is the only place that I've ever lived um, and I feel like I'm a product of this place, and, I, and for better or worse, like this is my home. This is where I'm from. So it's part of that. But now having said all of that, if I could afford it, I would go somewhere else. But it's not just because of Hagerstown. It's because of the weather. I would move someplace with nicer weather.
<laughs> if I could, afford, if I were rich enough to just pull up stakes and everybody would just move, you know, to somewhere else, I would move, you know, I would I would move to California or someplace with someplace with a nicer climate. Uh, but that's not necessarily a knock specifically on Hagerstown, although you know, again, if I could afford it, I would get the hell out of Hagerstown. So I don't know. It's complicated. It's very complicated. My relationship with Hagerstown. It's very complicated. Amanda Sylvester. I've seen a few of your videos where you use BC when referring to the years before Jesus' birth. Not to sound picky or overly critical, but I was wondering if you use BC slash AD instead of BCE slash CE out of habit or just haven't given it much thought. I ask because I haven't come across too many atheists, scientists, and skeptic thinkers who still use BC AD. Do you think it's revisionist to do so? Do you think people who use BCE, CE come off like even more like a smug atheist? Am I doomed forever to be perceived as an elitist jerk? No, it's, it's mostly habit, Amanda. Uh, I think uh, Common Era and Before Common Era is actually a much better way of dividing it than BC and AD uh, because then you're not, you're not sort of tied to a religious reference. Um, and also, I mean, BC and AD, even though we, we know what they mean, I mean, technically speaking, it's fairly well agreed upon that if Jesus was a real person, he was probably not born right on that dividing line between BC and AD. That sort of traditional estimate of the year Jesus was born is off by about four to six years. So Jesus was probably actually born, you know, either a few years BC or a few years AD. Uh, so, the, I mean, I, yeah, the, the, the common era before common era uh, system makes a lot more sense, is a much, much better system, is far superior, and I just neglect to use it often because of force of habit, you know? Um, I'm just, I just, I'm used to BCAD. I, I didn't encounter CE or BCE until I was well into school. I think I was in, I was probably in middle school when the first time I got a textbook, a history book that used uh, CE or BCE before AD and uh, instead of uh, AD and BC. So I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm just not, you know. Although having said that, I mean, I, it was in middle school and I am 35 now. So I've had over uh, over 20 years, 25 years or something like that, to uh, to figure it out. Not 25 years. I wasn't 10 in middle school, but you get the idea. Over 20 years to get used to it, and I and I'm saying I still haven't. So maybe that's just me making an excuse. Maybe I'm just stubborn and lazy. I don't know. But yeah, no, I have no problem with CE and BCE. I, I intellectually I prefer it, but I just don't use it as often, purely out of habit. <laughs> It's just like, if I really wanted to, if I applied myself, I could write a just perfect, hilarious, drop-dead, awesome segue from this segment to the next, but I just don't. And I'm stuck with shitty segues. Not because they're impossible, not because I don't think that better segues would be a good thing, but just out of habit. So I just kind of let things linger on the end of the answer to the last question in the main segment, and then when I run out of words, I say that it's time for the lightning round. Rapid fire questions, glib and adequate answers. The insane pumpkin carver, Ron versus Rand Paul? Well, see, that depends on the context. If you're talking about a fight where they're going to kick the shit out of each other for our enjoyment and amusement, then uh, it doesn't matter which one of them wins because everybody wins. But if it's an election where one of them has to be elected to a public office at the end, then it, again, it doesn't matter which one of them wins because everybody loses. Ahoy, oh, Erno. Since having a child, I noticed something. When I change her or wash her clothes and diapers, I get shit and piss all over my hands. But that's life. Last week, right before I went to work, she puked all over me. I just showered again, took a clean suit, and went to work. I became desensitized to things that used to utterly disgust me. So the question is this, was that too much information? Yes. Yes, but thank you for asking. Lucas Hackett, One Angry Brony. Hey Steve, I know this is strange for me to ask, but have you ever put butter on a Pop-Tart? If so, how did it taste? Um, I have never put butter on a Pop-Tart. That seems a little strange to me because there's icing on the top of the Pop-Tart already. But I anticipated it would taste good. 
I mean, if you're sort of, if this is your, your indirect way of kind of asking me to give you permission, like you need somebody to tell you it's okay to put butter on a Pop-Tart, put butter on a Pop-Tart. I bet it'll be good. Try it and let me know. Francois Lacombe. Hi, Steve. About that pen you always wear on your collar, do you sometimes worry that it could cause you a serious injury if you were ever in a car accident or a fall or some mishap like that? That's actually a fear, Francois, that haunts me my every waking moment. I worry about it constantly. But weighed against that is the question of what if I need to sign something and I don't have a pen? So I make the calculation. I make the bet. And I, I wear the pen. Zubel sticks. Dome City on Mars or Cloud City over Venus? I, I mean, I got to go with Dome City on Mars. I think Venus would be cool, but, uh, I mean, didn't you read that Ray Bradbury story? Venus only gets sun like one day out of the year. I couldn't stand that. I mean, I'm pale enough already. One day of sun a year? I'd be like Seamus over there. No, no. Mars. Dome City on Mars. Yarrow Kassir. Steve, I can't seem to find my dictionary, and I am so incredibly lazy that I can't bother Googling it. Can you define the word hogwash for me? Uh... Nonsense. Something that is ridiculous. Something that is preposterous. Bullshit. Uh, humbug. That's a good one. Uh, that's what hogwash is. For instance, I could use it in a sentence. Uh, your claim that you didn't have a dictionary and were too lazy to Google the definition of the word hogwash strikes me as a bit of hogwash. You get it? Kevin Logan, Steve's serious question. Where is the love? I thought you had it. You were supposed to watch it. I don't know where it is. I wasn't even looking for it. I thought you had it. If, if, the, if you don't know where the love is, I don't know where it is. So do not, if you're building up to trying to blame this on me, like someone's going to come in and say, Kevin, where's the love? And you're going to say, I don't know. Ask Steve. He was watching it. Bullshit. Fuck you. It was your responsibility. You're not pawning this off on me. The love was yours to look after. And if you don't know where it is, then that's on you. Gentle Hum 1, Steve, I'm a Yankees fan. Dad took me to my first game there when I was seven. <laughs> Does this mean you don't love me anymore? No, it doesn't mean I don't love you anymore, Gentle Hum, because I never loved you. I liked you very much, but love is a very strong word. And actually, I don't even know where the love is. Ask Kevin. Radical Bacon, I cannot cry for Scalia. Can you? Nope. And I haven't really tried, to be fair, but no, I cannot cry for Scalia. I don't want to celebrate his death, because I, I, I don't want to celebrate, like, revel in the death of anybody, but I'm not terribly upset. Christopher Mowdy. Questions for you had to ask, and I will take these one at a time. Do you cook? If not, why? If so, what's your go-to dish? Yes, I do cook, and I don't know. My go-to dish lately has been this thing I've made a couple times. Uh, it's like a bean and mushroom vegetarian burger, and it is fantastic. I really, really like that. Uh, do you manscape? Please explain. No, I don't, and my explanation is that I don't ever do it. That's why I said no. Why is Christopher Mowdy so awesome? I think it's the mustache. The mustache is just crazy lately. It's just a, a, a sight to behold. The mustache, the facial hair in general, I think is just absolutely on point. That's why Christopher, that's the only reason Christopher Mowdy is so awesome, but it's enough. It's substantial. Uh, would you rather walk to school or eat lunch? <laughs> um, eat lunch. I'm not walking to school if I don't have to. You give me the choice. If I was a kid, and you were my parent, and you said, Steve, you have a choice to make today, buddy. You can either walk to school or eat lunch. I would say, when's lunch? Done. Agreed. Done. That's the last question. Before I leave you, I'm going to give some lucky YouTuber, yeah, I guess that's a matter of perspective, a shout-out. And the shout-out this week goes to the YouTube channel of Aliyah Salim. Now, Aliyah's YouTube channel only has two videos on it to date, but both of those videos are on the subject of uh, Muslim women or ex-Muslim women 
uh, removing their hijab and the decision, the, the decision making process of why women decide to take the hijab off, why some women decide to leave the hijab on, why, why some women think it's, it's, it's a good thing for them to wear the hijab. It's a, a really, really interesting couple of videos that she has. First is a video she made about her own decision to remove her hijab, and then there's another video where she sort of suggests some strategies if you are a woman who wears a hijab and you want to take it off, like how you might safely go about that. If you are in a situation where you're facing like uh, social pressure or possibly fearing consequences if you take it off. Uh, both really interesting videos. And in addition to her YouTube channel, Aaliyah just in general is a, an awesome person that you should know about because I will just read you what she writes in her description on her, uh, on her Twitter account. She describes herself as ex-Muslim, atheist, feminist, co-founder of Faith to Faithless, secular education campaigner. That is a woman that you want to know about and you want to follow, I think, if you're anything like me. Now, she mentioned that she is the co-founder of Faith to Faithless. Uh, Faith to Faithless is an organization that is dedicated to helping people leave their religions, and particularly people who are members of religious minorities, which in the West would be someone like uh, a Muslim or a Jew, or a Jehovah's Witness, people who are members of religious communities that are already minorities in larger society, who are then facing the prospect of becoming minorities within minorities by coming out in their communities as non-believers and leaving their religions. Uh, it's a really great organization. It's a wonderful focus to have to try and help people who are in that situation. And if you want to learn more about it, you can go to faithtofaithless.com and learn more about this great organization and how maybe you can help if this is something that is important to you. It's a wonderful, wonderful thing. So check out uh, Aaliyah Salim, check out her YouTube channel, check out her uh, her Twitter account, follow her there, and go to faithtofaithless.com and check out that organization because it is absolutely fantastic and very needed in the world today. I also want to uh, remind you that there's something else that is not really needed, I have to admit, but is pretty awesome in its own right, uh, and that is the uh, Let Me Listen podcasts, which are created by my good friend and the brilliant and funny uh, Jason Harding, the creator of Opinionville here on YouTube. He is also the creator of a family of podcasts. There is Let Me Finish, which he co-hosts with Finite Atticus. That is just an awesome podcast, so funny. Uh, there is... American Monsters and How to Destroy Them, the improv comedy podcast that uh, is gearing up for its second season as we speak that is going to be really, really awesome that you should check out if you haven't listened to it already. And there is also Late Seating, the movie review podcast that Jason hosts with me where we take classic movies or notoriously bad movies and we watch them, we give them a fresh review, we tell you whether we like them or don't like them, we make fun of them as we summarize them, whether we like them or not, and we offer an opinion on whether we think it deserves to be a classic or reviled or hold whatever reputation it holds. It's such a fun show to do, it's a fun show to listen to, if I do say so myself, and if you listen to our most recent episode, you can hear our review of a film that was much beloved when I was a child, the never-ending story. That is the most recent subject of our Late Seating podcast. I would love for you to listen to it, hear what we have to say about the never-ending story. You can go to lemmylistenpodcasts.com and listen to that and all the other episodes of Late Seating and all the other episodes of all of the Lemmy Listen family of podcasts. lemmylistenpodcasts.com. It's so, so, so well worth your time, and I highly recommend it to you. And I thank you in advance for going and listening to those podcasts. Well, that is it for me, everybody. I am done. I am out of here. I want to remind you to please leave a comment on this video to ask me your question for next time. Ask me anything about anything. Nothing is too serious. Nothing is too silly. I will answer as many of your questions as I possibly can in the next video. So until then, take care, everybody. Hey folks, hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please like it and share it and subscribe to this channel if you're not subbed already. And also please consider helping me to make more videos like this one by supporting this channel through Patreon. You can go to patreon.com slash steveshives to become a patron. Thanks again for watching and I will see you next time.